I'm Lucy. And I'm Michelle. Welcome to another Tudor Cameo episode. These very short episodes will be slotted in between the normal ones, and we'll cover those characters who made a fleeting yet tantalizing appearance in other episodes. We don't always have a lot of information about them, so they can't have a full episode on their own, but they are too interesting to abandon completely, and they help to fill in the gaps and enable us to create as full a picture of the era as we can. And today, Sir Richard Nanfan. That's a lot fun to say. Nanfan. It is. I wonder if it is Nanfan or Nanfan. Or... I like Nanfan. We'll go with <laughs> Nanfan. The other, his, I've seen it written down as Nanfant as well with a P-H-A-N-T. <laughs> Sounds like infant. <laughs> well, I, was th- I was thinking more of elephant. It's oh, elephant. Pr- cross between an elephant and, and, and your nan. But we'll go with Nanfan, <laughs> I think. Uh, now I've got a picture of uh, an elephant <laughs> in a gingham dress. <laughs> <laughs> He was born in 1945. No, he wasn't. He was born in 1445. <laughs> yeah, I thought it would extend the, uh, the remit a little. <laughs> we'll never be done. Ever. 1445. And he was the son of John Nanfan. I'm really going to enjoy saying Nanfan <laughs> of Cornwall and Worcestershire. And of Jane, widow of Sir Renfrey Arundel of Lanhern. Okay. And I thought that name rang a bell. And his mother is from the same family as Henry Bodrigan's wife. Okay. So from the normal, are we talking about the noble family of Arundel? I don't know how noble they are. Gentry more than gentry, noble? Gentry, yes. Mm. Sorry, gentry. But I think there's a finite number of gentry families in Cornwall. So yeah, you have to take it from a small, well, gene pool, unfortunately, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> Not that I'm saying anything about Cornish people. <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> no, that would be um, people living in glass houses since they live in Somerset. <laughs> he was Sheriff of Cornwall from 1479 under Edward IV. But when Richard III came to the throne, Nanfan joined in the Exeter Risings in October 1483, oh. part of the Duke of Buckingham's rebellion. And he was attainted the following year. Ooh, I was going to say, that'll put him in good stead with Henry VII if he survives. Yeah, he's got to get through Richard first, yes. though, isn't he? I don't know why he rebelled, unfortunately. The Arundels were apparently very anti-Richard, but that was all the information I could find on that. Okay. Obviously, yes, as you say, he did much better under Henry. <laughs> <laughs> he was given several stewardships, which apparently were very good money spinners, and he became rich. Okay. He was in the Commission of Peace for Cornwall in 1485. And if you remember from the Cornish Rebellion episode, he was away in 1497 when the rebellion started. And it was his stand-in, Roger Wally, Whaley, Wally, <laughs> who told the king what was happening, a move that he may have regretted later when he got beaten up. <laughs> but Nanfan was said to have been the esquire of the king's body in the same year. We looked at somebody else who was a squire for the king's body that was, that was oh, who was that? But he, he was also the yeah. governor of Guernsey. And you said, well, it can't be because it'd have to be near the king's, the body, king's but... body. Yes. I looked up, I remember the episode, I don't remember who we were talking oh, about, no, but can't. a squire <laughs> of the king's body apparently can be f- up to five people because they right. do have other things to do. So they sort of take turns taking care of the king. Well, that makes sense because, yes. um, yeah, he would be quite a, quite a long way away down in Cornwall. Mm-hmm. He sat in the King's Council in 1486 and in 1488 went to Spain to negotiate the marriage of Prince Arthur to Catherine of Aragon. Mm. And he seems to have used this trip to make a bit of money on the side since he came home with 20 tonnes of salt. Wow. Oh, mm. good, good investment. Good thought. <laughs> and it was at this time that he was knighted by Henry VII. In 1493, he was working in Ludlow for Prince Arthur's court. He was also involved in negotiations with the Duke of Saxony to try and get rid of Richard of the Pole. All these people seem to be everywhere, don't they? Yes. After Henry's so-called invasion of France in 1492, which culminated in the Treaty of Etape, a large annual payout to Henry, Perkin being turfed out of the French court, and an irate and resentful Maximilian, Nanfan was given the job of Deputy Lieutenant in Calais under Lord Dobney. Oh. And and for our American listeners, Lieutenant. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) 
Canadian too. <laughs> Lord Dobney was often absent, so Nan Fan was effectively running the place. And now we get to an interesting episode. In 1504, a potentially treasonous conversation took place in Sir Richard Nan Fan's house in Calais, which gives us a glimpse into the into an interesting aspect of Henry VII's later life. There were five men at this gathering, Nan Fan himself, Sir Sampson Norton, the master porter, and we know he doesn't carry suitcases. <laughs> Yeah, we were being facetious when we made up that song. <laughs> but it was great. Sir Hugh Conway, the treasurer of Calais, Nan Fan's son, William, and Nan Fan's son-in-law, John Flamanc. Really? Mm, the younger brother of Thomas Flamanc, the leader of the Cornish Rebellion. Yes. No sources I looked at even commented on this fact. <laughs> One of them said he was the younger brother, but he didn't say what effect that would have had on either of them. So, yeah. Interesting. Because usually the whole family suffers when somebody goes against the king. John certainly didn't suffer. Really? Mm. He must have had some pretty high up protection and friends then. Unless he just said, look, he's nothing to do with me. <laughs> that didn't work honestly. before. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, possibly he's suffered at the time, but we're... What are we on, seven years now from the Cornish Rebellion? He's worked his way back up. Yeah, people did. People were forgiven, weren't they? Yes, eventually. Nan Fan obviously knew that this conversation was going to get a bit dodgy since he made William and John Flamanc swear on a Bible that they wouldn't repeat anything that went on in that room that evening. Were they in a pub? <laughs> no, they <laughs> weren't. Walls. They, were, they were in a room in Nan Fan's house. Okay. Hmm. Still servants. I guess they were all ushered out and told... I hope so. ...run along and play. <laughs> Conway told of how, when he'd arrived in Calais three months before, he'd sensed that the garrison wasn't loyal. It was almost as if he could smell treason. <laughs> OK. He'd done some digging and had even discovered a plot to murder Nanfan. And who was he blaming? Lord Dobney himself. Really? The garrison had been recruited by Lord Dobney. And even more worrying, Conway said, Lord Dobney was responsible for appointing the servants at Henry's court. Okay. He even appointed the yeoman of the guard. Oh. Henry's personal bodyguard. Yes. And what frightened Conway was that when the king died, Henry VIII would find himself surrounded by people loyal to Dobney and not loyal to the king. Ah. Well, Nan Fan found this almost unbelievable because Dobney had been with Henry in exile in Brittany and France. And it's like accusing John de Vere of disloyalty. Yes. But then, when Nan Fan thought about it, hadn't Dobney been a bit slow in putting down the Cornish Rebellion? Apparently, Dobney's orders had been to put a stop to the Cornish March before they got anywhere near London. So why hadn't he done it? And why had he let them get all the way to Blackheath? And wasn't it a little odd that when he was captured by the Cornish, he was released unharmed? Hmm. Conway then went on to say that the king was, quote, a weak man and a sickly, not likely to be a long-lived man. Which is treasonous in itself. Really. You're not meant to talk about the king's no. death, are you? And we've had a couple of other people that got in trouble for doing that. Hmm. Certainly people did in Elizabeth's time, didn't they? Yes. But he said that the king had been ill on an occasion when Conway himself was with the court. And people were talking about who would take over when Henry VII died. And some said the Duke of Buckingham, some said the Earl of Suffolk, and nobody mentioned Prince Henry. Really? Hmm. Not at all? Well, according to Conway, we're hearing this through Conway, so... Yeah. He might be exaggerating, but he certainly was worried enough to... To, to mention this to Nan Fan and several yeah. other people. So with people dismissing Henry as a potential ruler and the court being filled with servants and soldiers who weren't loyal to him, the outlook for young Henry was looking very bleak on his father's death. And he couldn't expect any help from the Calais garrison. Conway then tried to divine the date of the king's death using an astrological book. 
So he's skating a very thin ice, I'd have thought. <laughs> why? 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 I why? don't know. I'll never understand that. They believed in it all, didn't they? Samson Norton didn't believe Conway and told him to burn the, burn the astrological book because he was going to get himself in a lot of trouble. And I suppose Norton was thinking, and I shall be in trouble by association. Mm -hmm. Conway then listed the people back in England, and particularly in Kent, just over the Channel, who were potential traitors to the king, including Sir Richard Guilford, who'd also been in exile with Henry VII, and Sir Edward Poynings. Oh, hello! <laughs> <laughs> Remember him? <laughs> he wasn't impugning their loyalty to Henry VII, but he was asking, did that loyalty extend to his son? Which is still a sketchy thing to say. It's putting you in danger. Yeah, well, I think he thought it was important enough to... To risk it. To say, yeah. Brave. And what he was actually saying was not, how can we protect Prince Henry, but how can we protect ourselves in the event of a coup? Because he was thinking it was going to go back, you know, like the War of the Roses. Right. That was his worry. Norton then asked Conway why, if he was so concerned, did he not tell the king of his fears? But Conway had been there before. He'd previously told Reginald Bray about a Yorkist plot soon after Henry had taken the throne, and he'd been taken before Henry, where his refusal to reveal his source had infuriated the king, so much so that Conway vowed never to pass information like that on again. OK. Since he felt that he was the one under suspicion rather than yes. the Yorkists. which is how that worked quite often for a lot of people. They'd rat out somebody and everybody would turn and look at them instead, even though they were telling the truth. Well, yeah, Nam Phan said he'd been in a similar situation himself when he tried to tell the king that James Tyrrell and the Earl of Suffolk were plotting and he ended up with the feeling that Henry distrusted him more than the men he'd come to warn him about. Yes. Which was particularly vexing, given that he was absolutely right. He was totally right. <laughs> so in the end, nobody passed these fears on to the king. <laughs> oh, <laughs> see? Mm. However, the king did get to hear of this conversation, which is odd, given that everyone had been sworn to secrecy. Of course they had. So who was the mole? John Flamanc, despite swearing on the Bible that he wouldn't tell a soul, told the king everything. Okay. So, so again, Nam Phan and Conway were suspects oh, for trying to protect no. the king. Flamanc seems to have done this purely out of spite, since he'd just he'd fallen out with his father-in-law. And sadly, I couldn't find out why they'd fallen out, but it must be something pretty massive to shop his own father-in-law. <laughs> Okay, that's a term you're going to have to explain to North Americans. Shopping somebody. Oh. Grass? Does that mean anything? To grass no. on someone? No, we're okay. Oh, we're stuck in, stuck in England speak. Um, <laughs> Shopping is snitch. basically ratting out. Ratting, And quite yes. often um, doing it so you don't get in trouble yourself. So mm. I have heard like when you shop other people, you're involved, but by ratting out, you get a better deal in court kind of thing. You're yeah, no longer possibly. in trouble, even though you were involved. Yeah. Mm. Although you can just shop someone just when you're not involved. But yes. yes. Snitches yes. get stitches. That's another way North Americans know it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Flamanc's motives in all this are really interesting and frustratingly unknown. His elder brother had gone into battle against Lord Dobney and Henry. Henry had executed him and left his body parts dotted around London. Yes. So what did Fl John Flamanc think of this? I mean, presumably he knew or had met Dobney since they're all in Calais together. Yeah. And what did people think of him? Did they feel he was in tainted? But presumably not, because he was able to marry Sir Richard Namphan's daughter, and he later became both MP and Mayor of Bobmin. So he's brother to somebody who was treasonous. Hmm. He was friends with somebody who was treasonous, both executed. And he still manages to keep his head above water. I'm impressed. And he's the, he's the son-in-law of someone who's treasonous. Yes, I'm really well, impressed. Well, suspected of treason. Yes, which is enough. And also, what was that argument about? I'd love to know. I don't know. Henry didn't act on the information immediately. But in 1506, two years later... Typical of Henry. Very much so. <laughs> He just sits like, I mean, he's the universal spider, isn't it? Sitting in the yes. middle of his web. And just watching, waiting. waiting until you cannot get away before. Dun, dun, dun. Mm. 
<laughs> Again, <Wrapping> you up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lucy and I are using so many hand gestures that won't come across. But yes. <laughs> I wonder if we should start video recording these and putting these, uh, us recording up on YouTube <laughs> so people get the play by play. No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not do that. Okay. Uh, he, he, was, he was waiting for information from his spies and then he pounced. He ordered the dismissal of Conway, Norton and Nanfan. It's not very fair on Norton because Norton was saying, no, he isn't, the <laughs> way <Wait> through. <laughs> and just thinking, no, I've got my fingers in my ears. I can't Do, hear. Don't want to be here. Not here. <laughs> not here. Conway was reinstated. I don't know what happened to Norton. And Nanfan retired to his Buckinghamshire estates in England, where he remained suspect, unfortunately. But he was old by this time and apparently he was only too happy to retire and just leave it all behind. <laughs> Oh, the poor guy. It sounds like he's just trying to do his best, darn it. Well, soon after, Henry went after Dobney. And I shan't go into detail because we're planning a cameo episode about him. Yes. And also, I haven't actually looked at it yet, so I can't. <laughs> <laughs> because we're doing an episode, I thought I'll, I'll save that. So maybe Henry had taken on board what Conway and Nan Fan had been saying. Perhaps he just likes to keep everybody on their toes, doesn't he? Yes. Well, if nobody's secure, then everybody will be trying to keep the king going. But all this explains the secrecy and speed with which Margaret Beaufort and others made sure that Prince Henry reached the throne before anybody really knew what was happening. Yes. Yeah, they moved very fast. They did. And apparently they also made sure that all the important people were at Richmond and they sort mm -hmm. of shut the door. Yeah, for three days. Three days while they were working things out. Mm. But it was also yeah. so they couldn't get in touch with people outside. Ah. And start cooing. Right. Mm. Makes it sound like chickens. <laughs> or pigeons. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Nan Fan's chaplain was a certain Thomas Woolsey. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did he know about the conversation? When yes. Anfan came back to England, he <laughs> recommended Wolsey to the king as a young man to watch. Okay. So, whatever happened to him? Oh, I have no idea. And Anfan died on January the 1st, 1507. He left two daughters, whom he'd had with his wife, and two sons, whom he hadn't. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and Wolsey was one of the executors of his will. I thought you were going to say Wolsey was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Like, oh my well, gosh! <laughs> well, we don't know what went on in Calais. <laughs> in a book published in 1602 called The Survey of Cornwall, the author, Richard Carew, made a list of military worthies of Cornwall. First, King Arthur. Of course. Second, Sir Tristram. Third, Sir Richard Nanfan. Oh. I don't know the second one. Sir Tristram, that's... Um, a, a, a romance. Um, he Was he, he has all sorts of adventures. No, I don't think so. Legendary. So the, really, the top one is Richard Nanfan. Yes. <laughs> when you said he died, he Ooh, died of natural don't causes. Say, don't say that King Arthur doesn't exist in Glastonbury. You'll be lynched. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I won't go to Glastonbury because no. I don't believe it. No, I don't. I'm 10 miles away from Glastonbury, so I'm far enough away to say it <laughs> safely. <laughs> but while we're on the subject of Woolsey, I just thought I'd mention how sad it is that Hilary Mantel has just died. Who oh, wrote, Who no. wrote Wolf Hall and all the others. Oh, that's sad. Hmm, died suddenly. So this is... this. I'd, I'd like to say this this episode is dedicated to her, but she might not have wanted it, so I shan't. <laughs> <laughs> Who are these people? <laughs> yes. Leave me alone. Yeah, brilliant writer. Very sad. Yeah. So that is the end of the story of the third greatest military worthy in Cornwall. <laughs> well, you didn't say how he died. You just said he died. I'm assuming it's natural causes? Yes, I think so. Okay. It wasn't syphilis. So he managed to get away with all of it. He <laughs> <It> wasn't squishy. <laughs> I don't know. It's probably gout. <laughs> if it's not syphilis, it's usually gout, yes. isn't it? Yes. I don't, he, was, he was an old man by their standards. Well, good for him. He managed mm. to navigate through without being 
are tainted for treason. Yes, which makes you think that perhaps, although Henry was sort of keeping them on a string a bit, that he might have believed them. Mm. So he thought, well, I'm not going to taint them because they're telling me the truth. And Yes. But he was strongly risking people not telling him anything. I mean, these people weren't going to tell him. Yes. About Lord Dobney. Because of his behaviour to the people who were telling him mm. stuff. And he was surrounded by Lord Dobney's men, if what they say is true. Yes. If, if, if his own bodyguards are suspect. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's quite dangerous. Uh-huh. <laughs> I mean, you have, the king is dead, and then, oh, and so's the next one. <laughs> <laughs> so. Long live the Dobney? <laughs> <laughs> Who? Who? So that's Richard Namfan. Cool. Hmm. We don't know a lot about him outside this one conversation, but I thought the com- one conversation threw up so many fascinating Tidbits. possibilities. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So thank you for listening, and we'll see you on the next one. Yes, whatever that next one is. It's a sheer anarchy, isn't it, this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye.